by CME Group, where risk meets opportunity, and of course, our data partner, FactSet. Um, they are our fabulous data partners. All the charts and analytics you see here come to you by FactSet. Uh, Guy Dami's not here today, Danny, but you're here, and I appreciate that. I'm a pleasure to be here, buddy. All right, we're, we're a little fired up here today. Um, like, the market's moving, and it hasn't been moving a whole heck of a lot of late. You know, we talked about this yesterday, Guy and I. When we started last week, the VIX was at, like, 13. We were heading into a week where, you know, we had the biggest equity in the entire market. This was Apple was going to be reporting, and we had VIX at levels that were just, like, really, really depressed here. And so it's just kind of interesting that here we are a week later. I know it's summer, man. I know it's August. I know that people just kind of don't seem particularly bothered about too many things right now. But what do you like? What, what what's your like vibe right here as you think about the markets? We have the S and P down about a percent today. We have the Nasdaq about one point three percent. We have a VIX it's now seventeen and a half or so. Not much going on with yields. Yield curve is still inverted to tune about seventy five basis points or something like that. What's your mood here, brother? I'll tell you what happened. Being away last week is actually helpful because it creates a better vantage point, yeah. I think, for things. And so I go back to the Bank of Japan. I go back to ten days ago. And thinking about what they did in the yield curve that they moved the yield curve control from. 50 All right, so to let's just do point. this really quickly. And just explain to our listener if they're right here right now and they've been hearing about YCC yield curve control. What does that mean, and why has it caused a bout of volatility across a lot of risk assets in the last week and a half? Let me talk about it philosophically, yeah. and then I'll talk about Got what it means. It. This whole global central bank liquidity started with Japan. 40 years ago, yes. this whole thing started with Japan. They were the original kind of printers of money, yeah, right? Geez. And the fear was always that the U.S. eventually will turn into Japan. Granted, it's different demographics that are in Correct. Japan. And so we've been living in this global central bank liquidity world. They bail us out of everything. Well, we got tested with the Bank of England, remember, yep. last year in the fall. You saw a little taste of that when it can not work. Yep. You're seeing it again with Bank of Japan, how it might not work. I think underestimating the amount of liquidity that it can be taking out of the system, so to speak. So what did they do exactly? They basically had a yield curve control up until December of last year was a range of zero to 25 basis points where they keep their 10 year yields intact because they want to obviously promote growth. But they also know that they have a lot of debt outstanding. Right. right? And they've been trying to encourage inflation in that country, which has been non-existent for 30 they years. They want to inflate their debt. They're finally doing right? what we yeah, did. Yeah. And they're inflating. They're up to three percent now or north of three percent. So they said, all right, well, end of last year, they went 25 to 50. Then they come out 10 days ago. You eat his debut really as BOJ governor and says, you know what, we're going to. We're going to basically track 50 basis points and we'll allow this thing to go up to 1%, the 10 year yield in Japan. Within hours, it went to 60 yeah. basis points. And they said, oh, we'll buy some at 60. We'll buy some at 65. So this is going to be an ongoing thing. And so I don't know in real time, they're the largest owner of Japan of US treasuries. Mm -hmm. So last week, when Fitch downgraded the US rating, and everyone's like, oh, Yields are up because Fitch downgraded. Well, if that's actually true, that people are starting to worry about the credit worthiness of the U.S., we have bigger issues. I think part of it might be pressure selling because Japan has to repatriate money back so that they can defend their debt and their currencies yep. and so forth. So what we've seen is the yen weaken. So the point get, is a seller of U.S. Treasuries, the largest holder of U.S. The largest treasury. foreign holder foreign of U.S. Holder, yeah. We know who the largest holder of U.S. Yeah, yeah, is, the yeah, Federal Reserve, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I just think when you take a step back and look at this, you're talking about earnings that have occurred. Earnings are fine. You know, they're going to be down over 5%, according to FactSet, for the second quarter. But companies are obviously beating lowered expectations and so forth. But the market's expensive, Dan. So I've been talking about who is the incremental buyer of equities yep. at 40 times earnings, 50 times earnings. And we'll get into some of these things here. And so things feel the diciest that they have felt in in some time to me. So, so. Two, I think almost three weeks ago, we had Mike Wilson, uh, CIO at Morgan Stanley Asset Management, their head strategist. He was on the pod with us, Guy, Danny, uh, and myself. We were all sitting down with him. And he was echoing what you were saying about what could happen with the Bank of Japan. And he thought that might be a, a bit of a trigger for some volatility in a market that had just literally been bottom left, upper right for the better part of seven and a half months or so. So do you think that that, like, like that, that flip you know, the switch has been flipped a little bit. Is it hard to put the genie back in the bottle? We know that there's been a very low vol rally in equities and it's done okay as inflation has come down and rates have gone up. And and I think that's the true test, Danny, that like a lot of bears, like us included, thought that the stock market, at least valuations, would be pressured by higher yields. That hasn't been the case. And the S&P, if we want to throw up the chart of the S&P futures here, you know, it's down 3%-ish 
from the 52 week highs. It was in a whisper of the all time high of 4,800, which you made in January 2022. And you look at that thing, I think all of us agree that 4,350 level or so would be a great level to check back. It would probably, it's, you know, it, it would probably. Uh, be a VIX at a, like above 20 at that point. And we can agree that there'd be some fear back in the equity market. You agree with that? Yes. And, you know, people say, oh, a help, uh, pullback is healthy. I'll yeah. buy it on a pullback yeah. until it actually happens. And then people start to question. This has been my argument the whole time. At what level of the S&P trading north of 19 times earnings do you say, oh, it looks cheap? Yeah. I mean, every multiple point is effectively 5% or north of 5%, you know, down in the market. So call it 220 points in the S&P. I hate to equate the mark, the stock market's gambling, which is what people have done, you know, the last couple of years. But let me give you an example. If anyone that plays blackjack or craps out there, you know, when you're at a hot table, you know, when you're blackjack, you know, the cards are coming in, you feel good about it. You know, when you're in craps and the dice are coming, it feels good. There's a feeling that comes over the table sometimes where the dice are in the air and you say to yourself, if I could take everything off the table, I know I'm going to seven out right here. It feels like to your point, things have changed. Like there's been a dynamic yeah. change in the attitude. And that is Dan, as simple as who is the incremental buyer? Now, Mike Wilson was on this podcast and subsequently put out a report the following Monday. He did not turn bullish. Nope. He basically said, I'm wrong on my timing, yeah. but I don't think I'm wrong. And he kept his 3,900 target, if I'm not mistaken, on the S&P. But who cares about targets? Let's just talk about reality. You're talking about. So now what I think about it is who is the incremental buyer? Everybody's kind of, you know, has moved onto that side of the boat. And that's why I'll stay firm in my belief that yeah. be smart. Again, look at these drug stocks that are up. We're going to talk about them. You can own things, you know. Of course, but all right. So let me push back a little bit here because again, I think what's very clear is that the consensus when the S and P was at its lows in October of 2022 is that there was going to be a recession in the first half of 2023, and you better be positioned for it. You better be in defensive names. You better get out of the high valuation stuff that is likely to be hard hit, especially as you know the Fed is raising interest rates, to battle inflation, and a stagflationary environment that's going to be bad for high multiple stock. Well, the calendar turned in January. And you know what happened? It was like rip diddy doo dah. It was off to the races in, in the stuff that just inflated again. It got to the most expensive sort of stuff. And they had the benefit in hindsight of just this AI bubble. When I think about it, though, Danny, is if we were to see a retest of that 4350 and you see that rising, if we want to put that SP chart back up there and you see that rising, you know, 200 day moving average at 4125, let's say we get to 4200. Okay. So from 46, you know, and change to 4200, down 10%. I think that is clear clearly a level that if you are not on the, the hard landing camp, and I don't know if anybody's left in the hard landing camp, most people are in the no landing camp, but let's just say at 4,200 in the S&P or 4,150, because that's where the 200 day moving, that's when you actually start to buy. Well, okay. Well, Even if you're going to have a soft ish landing, a, like a, a, a shallow recession sometime late this year into next year, I think you have to, depending upon your time horizon. I, Listen, I think it's still stock selection. It, maybe it's not the S&P. Maybe it's the Russell. Maybe it's something else. We are ignoring yeah. some of the big elephants in the room. What are the big elephants in the room? To your point you just made, the timing of, quote, what is a recession? We have had a rolling recession. Great article today out on Bloomberg Let's about that. that. Let's pull it up. The one thing that people, and I put myself in the camp, yeah. underestimated is the services sector, right? People spending on things and yeah. traveling. It's been outrageous, right? And that's great. The consumer never underestimate the U.S. consumer yeah. for spending. That's been carrying this economy. Let's be clear. The manufacturing sector, for the most yeah, part, moved from goods has, to services. We saw that has been in a recession. Yep, yep. And when you read an article like this, and I'm not cherry picking to find anything negative, people should read that article for themselves and just yeah. go, go through it. It's telling you what's happening. You don't have to have a definition of a recession to make the market go lower. That's what I'm confused about. People's cause and effect. Oh, there's the recession. Let's sell off the market. You find out there's a recession two quarters after it's already Correct. occurred. So it's all, you all know. right. This is really important, though. Yeah. So there are sector specific slumps in manufacturing, chemicals, cardboard boxes, freight, tech electronics, residential, uh, commercial property, M&A and average. I don't know what that right. is, but in the advertising is obviously very cyclical. But I, I want to focus on manufacturing, chemicals, cardboard boxes and freight. Right. Those things are like that. those the are lifeblood of the lifeblood of an economy. And I get that. But I guess the point is what's going to happen. Let's pull up the CME Fed funds tracker here a little bit, because I know it's something that you keep one eye open on all the time. The moment, let's just say, if we were to have unemployment that in July got down to three and a half percent, let's just say a slowdown is confirmed, okay, by the data weakening and then unemployment going up. The Fed fund, what is it pricing right now out in March of 2020? 60% uh, chance of a rate cut occurs okay. in March. So that's basically telling you 
that there's likely going to be a recession at some point. Isn't that recession odd? Well, it's gone from 50 to 60 in the last it's week. Per, yeah. But here's, I think it, I think it's better said this way. If you're buying the market or believe that the market will rally on the Fed quote being done, we are down to 13% chance of a rate hike in 43 days, whenever yeah. the next meeting is. Yep. That's not a reason to own the market. That's Correct. not a large delta. So to your point, Dan, what would cause that to accelerate itself, meaning a rate cut, maybe it comes in December, maybe market would have to sell off a lot from here for those things to kind of even out. So if your thesis on owning the stock market is that the Fed is done, I don't think you're doing digging deep enough, Dan, in terms of, of what the market's kind of giving you. And so there are a lot of signals out there. And yes, we're coming. We're almost done with the quarterly earnings. I think we're 80, 85 yep. percent through here. And as I mentioned, they're down 5.2 percent. Right. There's been more negative guidance given than positive guidance, just so we know from the S&P 500 companies, according to FactSet. And so here we are. So, again, what do I say? Every day is a new underwriting opportunity. Yep. I think the NASDAQ rebalance from a couple of weeks ago gave people an excuse to look in the mirror and look at these names and say, hold on, rebalance, whatever yep. that means, dropping 2% yep. here, dropping 2%. What do I own? And when NVIDIA reports, I believe on the 23rd, mm -hmm. I think that's kind of the last big one yep. to, to kind of go. It's like, tell me what they can report that's going to make the stock move higher. Again, I'm not short it. I wouldn't be short I'll it. I'm not telling you to go short it. Yeah. Okay. We've seen what Microsoft has done since they've reported. And you called on July 18th, you said this is it's down 10% yeah. since then, right? That, These are big market so. cap names. So let me complete my thought and bring you back to your question you asked me yeah. a couple minutes ago. Is 4250 the right place to buy the SP? I don't know. If the big seven go down 20% mm -hmm. each, you tell me what that we're already probably at 4250 <laughs> if that were. Well, to here's the good news, so, right? So so we've seen some two of the biggest names, Microsoft and Apple, that make up combined 13 or 14% of the SP 500. They make up 20. 20 some percent of the nasdaq 100 they're down more than 10 percent, and both of those indices are down about three percent or so so in many ways um we're seeing like good rotations away from some of those big names excuse me <coughs> got you all choked up you do yeah um so i think that is really interesting let's see how long those sorts of rotations can hold up a little bit here, but um, here, take over the reins for a second there, Dan. Yeah, I was going to say, so I do want to shift to the banks as Dan's having an attack here. Yeah. Um, I do want to shift to the banks for a second because they are central to everything, right? And we've had a lot of news today in the U.S. banks and in Europe. And so we can begin with either the Italian banks here, which the deputy prime minister in Italy decided to throw basically a 40% tax on excess earnings, saying that the banks in Italy should not be benefiting from the ECB raising rates, and therefore they should tax those profits, those incremental profits, and give them back to people that have mortgages, right? And so that yeah. since banks are running, that is a, you know crazy out of nowhere left field Seems type very European thing. though, right? Seems, <laughs> but I'm saying that's scary. And over here, and so you're seeing in Tesa, Unicredit, those, those stocks start to get hit, and that's a wake up call, right? In here, what did Moody's do? Moody's downgraded kind of ten regional type banks, saying that their asset liability management is coming into question, which yeah. we already knew. They're actually doing something about it, Moody's. So you had Fitch downgrade the U.S., you had Moody's downgrade yeah. 10 U.S. regional banks. You have them put on negative watch, many other big ones, pointing out what we kind of already already know that's kind of out there. So it's not totally market moving, but you know, Moody's got a lot of crap, and rightfully so, for years for missing the subprime. Yeah. So I feel like they're going to be much more vigilant this time around. And so the banks, to me, have been the driver. They've been, you know, underperformer for most of the year. They've reared their head up here in the last couple of weeks. This is another excuse to take a tough look at them. And the Fed just having raised rates. And the Moody's report just goes into everything that people should understand, but people should actually read it. And so here you're going to lose a sector that had pretty decent momentum. So when you're talking about where do people go if they go out of big tech, yeah. energy seen a little bit of a nice rotation here. I think, you know, it's <laughs> energy, form. industrials, transports. Yeah. So I want to go back to the S&P 500 for a second here because I, I pushed back a little bit. You know, we, we talked about this notion and, and you were joking me before we came on here. You were listening to me uh, on Market Call or, or one of these things. It says sounded like you threw in the towel. I, I threw in the towel on a couple of names. This was early last week or it was actually at a July expiration or so because that's where I had a lot of my exposure, Danny, and NVIDIA and Tesla and, and, and people who watch this or listen to the market call, they know it's kind of like a moth to flame to two of the biggest stories, okay, that in the market over the last few months or so that encapsulated a lot of the excitement, I think, in and around some of the advances as it relates to AI. NVIDIA as a supplier of some of the chips, they just have a new uh, chip out today, a higher performance ooh. sort of chip, oh, and ooh, the Grace Hooper or something <laughs> right. like that. And then obviously Tesla, you know, it, you know, a lot of the technology in and around their goal of full self-driving is very much AI enabled when you think about autonomous driving, okay? So there was a lot of excitement around those two things. 
I threw in the towel on both of them about a week and a half ago. I got back in on Friday afternoon. Again, with puts, I define my risk. I, I pick a spot. You just said NVIDIA reports August 23rd. What can they do? If they don't beat what they just guided from $7 billion in revenue to $11 billion for the quarter just ended, if they don't meaningfully beat that and they don't guide up any meaningful manner, this is a company that's gained hundreds of billions of dollars of market cap since that guidance. This stock's going down. Dan, I mean, like, plain and simple. Dan, it wasn't what you said. Yeah. It's how you said it. Yeah, defeated. Yeah, you. it was almost I like was. the last... No, so I think it's more... My point is this. You take the emotion out of it. Yeah. You knew that it's the wrong time, deep down, that you just have had it. Because you have in. risk... No, you have risk parameters. That's what, well, that's I what let, good I traders... Well, out the window. Actually. That's what good, <laughs> that's what good traders do. But let me just say something on this Tesla, right? Yeah. So the CFO, mm -hmm. who was there for, what, 13 years? Kirk Horn. Yeah. You announced it yesterday. Yeah. First of all, it was, it was actually a Friday night dirty. Yeah. There wasn't really It was in a filing, right? Yeah, it was filing was on a Friday night, but it didn't get released. But not in, inner quarter? Like, normally you would see something yeah, like that when it, you report. No, you would do it on the report. You would do it on the and report. And you would do it with some fanfare. It's like, you know, you, you would have Elon basically yeah. say, Kirk has been a great partner of mine. We've accomplished so much. Right, it was a we weird. We've got to the... a trillion dollars in market cap. We've gotten to $150 billion in sales. We have margins that are better than every, you know, automotive. Bubble so we used bubble. to have this, uh, so you know the red flag in football where the yeah. coaches throw when yeah, they want to review. Like, so Vinny Porter and I in the office used to have, we had the red flag. It was used at various times. We would go, we would go run quietly, yeah. quietly run. Bring it back to the trading desk and when something like that would happen we would pick up the red flag and we would throw it as hard as we could across the room because we know it means something yeah. i don't care that it's tesla it could be any company when your cfo leaves and by the way gamestop of course all these things happened yeah. while i was gone cfo also left yeah. that's a whole nother whole nother issue you have to ask questions do not put this oh it's fine no it's probably not fine but i don't know what it would be and i'm not saying go out and short it but if you're long the stock and that happened just ask yourself be honest with yourself like it's kind of a strange thing to occur that, at this point we know that there's a lot yeah. of hair around the accounting we know that right i'm not saying we know that it. so just just give 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 some oh, i'm not going down that no that no path. no but like so 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 there's part there's there's a big part of the bear thesis that these guys play fast and loose with with what well, how you recognize revenue right. are you recognizing you know full yeah, self-driving channel and they yeah listen it stuff. is what it, my point is that there's nothing more important that company than accounting and i mean that in yeah. a good way i don't mean that they're does changing. it make you feel better that the new cfo came from solar city <laughs> came from solar city which was also a pillar of the bear case and when elon's other company what was it with his cousin or something like that Listen. when it was floundering they just bought it and and uh, there were major this, lawsuits about all that this to me for uh i don't know what the market cap 800 billion where are we on 800 800 billion, billion, billion yeah. dollar company which we know doesn't have a uh, you know a, a board that really polices yeah. anything normally if this was going to be happening this seems like it happened rather quickly you would do an external search at the same time but i don't think they want anyone to come in from the outside because yeah. i don't maybe you know I, I don't know but we can move on but point is that people long or short this thing um that is a to me a red well, flag and I, I you know so. my initial thought was that if someone came in from the outside from a very reputable company or reputable reputable auditor or something like that, somebody with some real clout for a 800 billion dollar market cap company this is like one of the top seven or eight market caps yep. in our market it probably deserves somebody a bit more than was at PwC for 15 years, Solar City for a year, bought in by Solar City, knows all the tricks that go on in Tesla. Like to me, that is not a great vote of confidence for a company that is one of the largest revenue generators. Um, you know what I mean on the sure. S and P and the Nasdaq. So it is what it is. So I have a, a small short position there. I want to go back to the S and P 500 for a second here, Danny. So I want to talk about. You know, it's interesting that you said Mike, Mike Wilson. This was a few weeks ago. He did not throw in the towel. Marco Kalanovic at JP Morgan, okay? He was actually, um, I think, remained bullish for the better part of, of last year, of 2022, when the market was in a bear market. He turned uh, bearish on the economy, okay, in the markets. This was late in the year. And I'm not bringing him up. I, I really like Marco. I like his work and everything like that. But he's also continued to double down. This Monday when he came in, he's got a note out every Monday morning, just like Mike. Um, he said something like, if you're in the no landing camp, you're like delusional. OK, right. so you just want to put that out there. I thought that was kind of interesting. Now, for me, 
I, as a pundit, as a trader, I'm very frustrated with myself because I think we got a lot of things right collectively in 2021. We started doing on the tape podcasts in early 2021, and we had a market that was squeezing us in every which way, but it was doing it in names. It was doing it in parts of the markets, or it was doing it in risk assets that we thought was fugazi. And every single time you were calling the meme stocks, right? We were talking about crypto and NFTs and all the, the buy now, SPACs and all yeah. the, all right. So we had that. And then when it started coming apart, despite the fact that the major indices in late 2021 were still making highs, the stuff under the hood was a disaster, okay? And we had it. We had the market in 2022. But what we did was we, we just stayed too long, right? And we never like really adjusted. And we, like, I know I'm thinking about Guy. I'm thinking about you. I'm thinking about myself here. So we got trapped from a pundit standpoint. And this is new for you because you're a trader. You're an investor, that sort of thing. But you started doing a podcast. You started showing up every week and you started doing fast money. It's hard to both manage a trading book and then also have like this kind of non-stop sort of commentary about what's going on because you can't change your mind all the time. You have to stick to your guns. And that's why I'm bringing up Mike and that's why I'm bringing up Marco. So here's the deal. What I'm trying to look for are opportunities first as a pundit to kind of get a bit more constructive about different parts of the market, okay? So I'd like to see some fear back in the market. I'd like to see a 10% pullback in the S&P 500, okay? Then what would I like to see as a trader or an investor? I'd like to look at an entry point on a portion of a position that I've missed out on a bunch of this stuff. I believe that the AI thing is real. I believe that this is going to be a secular trend for 10 years that you can invest on a lot of the big companies in the NASDAQ. And then there's going to be lots of smaller ones that develop some stuff that is very useful. But what I don't like to do is buying into manias. And we had an all out mania this year and I fought it and I lost money. So what do I want to do? I want a dollar cost average, the QQQ or the S&P, which has tons of exposure to these names, but I need a pullback. I need some fear in the market, okay? Near term though, in the S&P, I want to set up a trade for you in the futures here, Danny, okay? And I want to see what you have to say here. Oh so we have the S&P. I want to play for a pullback. Carter Braxton Worth at Worth Charting had a great note yesterday talking about sequence in the S&P 500. He showed the uptrend channel. They've been in, in place for most of the year. You can kind of visualize it on this chart right here, okay? So right now, I, I'm seeing, we, we made these charts earlier in the day. Right now, it's 44.95 in the S&P futures here. I looked to short them right here. I want to stop this at 4560, up 65 points. Okay, you do the math, it's up a little less than one and a half percent. When I'm trading futures, I want to use really tight stops because if I get stopped out, I want to look for a re entry point. This is a trade here. Okay, my initial target to the downside would be about 4400, and then my next target is 4200. I think by the time it gets there, you're going to have the 200 day moving average working to that point. And then if you had that sort of move, you're getting close to 11, 12 percent peak to trough move. And I think that is the place if you can if you can execute that from a trading standpoint and get down there. That's when you want to cover that short and then you want to start picking at it on the long side with the idea that you might get down towards 3,900. And I just want to say 3,900, Danny, if we do have S&P earnings, let's say that get to $210 or something, if you do that math, you're at a more reasonable multiple of the S&P. What do you think of that from a trading perspective using the futures, tight stop to the upside, I'm looking for initial target of 4,400, then 4,200. I like the risk reward there. And then if I get to my downside down towards 4,200, I start picking, I start dollar cost averaging so yes I, I hear you i think i'm going to say a couple of things because a lot in there um we've seen the highs for the year in the market okay that's my thesis i love okay. it okay um so pick your spot whenever you want to trade around it i think single names here versus the s p may prove to be better why do i say that if the s p if you tell me the s p has a chance to get to 4200 right which is down roughly yeah. seven eight uh, percent where wherever we are i don't know what the number would be exactly yeah um I would tell you that some of the big winners are going to be down 30, 40, 50%. So I'd rather, me personally, yeah. find the names that I believe are overvalued. Dumb meme stock names that I know are on borrowed time, right? We can talk, you know, from a liquidity perspective, any individual out there trading doesn't, it's not going to trade S&P futures. They can certainly put on put spreads or something in a, yeah. we'll go into that, a name like an upstart, a name like an firm, a name like a Carvana name. Because if you tell me the S&P is going to 4,200, those are all gone. <clears throat> all those companies are gone. When I say gone, down 70, down 80 Yeah, you mean the gains that they've appreciated. The gains that appreciated from yep. gone. I'm not saying yep. they're bankrupt yeah, necessarily. Yeah, yeah. So I look at it a little bit differently. I don't disagree with any of those price points you just said, yeah. but I want to make something very clear. 
when the market goes to 4,400 or 4,300, it's going to feel like it's going to 2,500. Yeah. Because the reason that it's going to go there is either the loss of the faith in the central banking system, specifically our Federal Reserve, right, or whatever it might be. Inflation rears its head back up, and we're looking at stagflation. No one's ever traded through this. This, yeah. this is a generation of people that have never traded a cycle like this. And I'm going to take it back to the comment that you made. What has caused the market? What caused us to quote pundits to be wrong about the market? Behavioral finance caused it to be wrong. What do I mean? I'll say this again for people that don't listen on the tape, only watching this they market. They should be call. listening on the tape. Why are you guys not listening? If you're a portfolio tape? manager at a large, long only shop, you are paid to outperform your indice. Mm -hmm. Let's say the S&P 500. You do that by going underweight, overweight, or equal weight, various industries. The beginning of the year came around, people were underweight tech those people and they were overweight energy and financials and immediately after the first two weeks realized that they were off sides and their hands got forced right it got exacerbated on the nvidia quarter last quarter yep, and it later. all kind of changed from that it's like game on if you're a hedge fund now and you have managed to eke out double digit returns through this point in the cycle and you're a veteran hedge fund manager you are now going to rotate my opinion having been one so you know what feels pretty good I'm, no matter what the market does i'm pretty good year because we had a good year last yep. year whatever i'm going to rotate into things such as energy and maybe banks. This is why the bank news today. So meaningful or industrials or whatever, maybe kind of lower beta type names where I can feel safe, get a dividend, so to speak, and not have to worry. So that's why within the S and P to your point you're yeah. making, I don't know that we, if we're at 4,200, we're going to have a rotation. Some names will be flat, right? Obviously. And some of these, yeah. so I'd rather pick long winded way of answering, yeah. find the single names that shouldn't be where they are that are up there. And I'm not, bringing back up tesla because but i'm you're, bringing you're it up you're suggesting but people short things that were valid. most most people you know that just I don't, don't short but stuff Dan, some yeah. of these co some of these companies themselves are indices they're trillion dollars so it's yeah. not like it's not like they're not liquid no no but, but my point you're talking Dan, about tesla and you're talking about nvidia because those are the two nearly okay trillion well dollar you're market. not getting to 4200 on the s&p without right, those two, those two stocks listen those two stocks could easily go down 30 40 percent okay That's they both went down 70 percent from their highs in 2021 yeah let me tell you what's not going down 40% from here is is probably Apple, or is Microsoft. probably Microsoft, yeah. is probably Google, and is probably Amazon. Answer my question. So, so I am answering your question, but what I'm saying is, and this was my whole thing during 2022, okay, is just if you want to buy the market, dollar cost average, the QQQ, the NASDAQ 100, or the NASDAQ 100 futures, and if you did that all of 2022, you ended the year with an average, let's say whatever the equal amount is that you did every week or every month or something like that, you ended the, the year with an average higher than where, where, where you know, much higher than, than where it closed. So like that was a good trade. If I look at Apple and Microsoft that make up 20% of the NASDAQ 100, throw in Amazon in there and you get, you know, 26 or seven. So to me, that that's the way to but, trade it. And, but Dan, and, think yeah. about this. I don't disagree with you. Okay. But think about this. The, you're getting yields north of 5% on I know. U.S. Treasury. So Hold on a second. So, right, that's a great place to be. I'm saying this more importantly than I am about trying to short the market. Don't own crap yeah. here. And by the way, when I say don't own crap, sell your crap and buy treasuries with it. Yeah. Or even sell your crap and buy the S&P with it. Yeah, but this because is the, the crap, crap will they're YOLOing. They love this all they're stuff. Gonna get, they're all they're going to get yolo Look at the comments. I know, but I, what I'm, I'm not saying reading, is I don't they're, read they're like, they're up 3,000 That's fine, good for them. Carvana. Right, but that's... that's so a, we can tell them it's crap. Nah, and then it can go up listen. 2 000 You're asking me my opinion. I'm giving it to you. I'm no, trying to help people. I, and that's I, I right. get it. I'm just saying, like, listen, if that's what they want to trade, they want to trade some shit coin, they want to do that. But what I'm also talking about is, like, investing. You know what I mean? Like, you can't. How about this? How about all these dips are buys. I mean, you know like, what like they always are. What? And I'm a guy's Let's, not here. So it's gold. And why, why right, is gold a buy? Let's pull up gold. Let's pull up gold. Why we is gold a buy? Yeah. Because of all the things, the reason to keep on in the S&P 500, right? Yeah. First of all, there's no such thing as no landing. They're called cycles. It yeah. doesn't matter when you're going to have some type of landing. You want to have some type of landing. We're we're landing in various, which you go back to the opening ar article that we had. If people are owning the market because they think the Fed is done or people are owning the market because they think we've pulled forward rate cuts, gold is about to explode. And there was an actually an article yesterday in the Wall Street Journal about how many people are starting to own gold and buy yeah. it. I love gold here. I, I know it doesn't yield anything. Yeah, it doesn't I get yield it. anything. Oh, okay. It actually doesn't, doesn't move much. I mean, like, the, yeah. to be honest with you, I, I suspect it's going back to that 200-day moving average fairly soon. But, like, you know, I mean, uh, we have a makes, gamble. We're going to gamble. It makes you, if, if it makes you sleep better. Um, oh, well, it does. So. I want to pull up yields for a second on the 10-year here. Um, I think this is a really interesting one. We've kind of been tracking this sort of pattern here, Danny. And so we talked a lot about the 210 spread um, in the version. It's It's been 
steepening here, bearish steepening here. You had that breakout above <clears throat> that downtrend that had been in place since um, last fall or so. A failure here. Let's say it goes back and tests that 200-day moving average. Let's call it 371 or so. and That'd be very near the uptrend that's been in place for the last year or so. What would a lower 10-year yield mean for you? Would it be a signal that a growth is slowing and therefore what you just said about Fed funds pricing in in March of next year, a 67%, a 60% probability of a cut? Would that sort of signal that the kind of the easy, the easy trade off the lows for the economy, you know, with liquidity is coming out. It's over. Is that is that what? Yeah, what, it would mean know? risk off to me. Risk. You know, the yields coming in. Why are the yields? But, why but isn't it good for isn't it good for stocks if, if yields come in? Until the reason that they're coming oh, in. Oh, there you go. What the reason yeah. it would be that they're coming in. So you'll try to gauge the two ten spread, right? Because it's steepening. To your point, it went from one hundred to ten basis yeah. points now to just under seventy. I think is where we sit here today. I think that the two year will continue to come in as we kind of project, because I believe we're going to certainly get closer to the rate cut uh, coming. I think it'll be March, definitely, if not potentially sooner. And Dan, go back to what people got wrong. I mean, got wrong was the push out. I never thought the Fed would get to five and a half percent. I mean, in a million years, I thought that yeah. range would be five and a quarter, five and a half percent. Right. And I still think. But the one thing Moody's brought up, which was interesting, was quantitative tightening in their note, in their yeah. downgrade note for these banks. They said you're competing against the Federal Reserve also. and and bank deposits and so forth. It's like you're this whole thing. So there's a lot here. And again, I think a lot of the stuff that people don't need to pay attention to, but should know about like Bank of Japan. We started this 30 yeah. minutes ago about yeah. what, why do I care? What does that mean? Right? So I think it's philosophically important, but I also think it's structurally important because I believe when we see the next report on net sales by Japan of US treasuries, yeah. we're going to see an outflow. Yeah. I think that's important. And when you start to see things like that, I mean, China is horrendous right now. Their imports, their export, it, they can't stimulate all this. All the stuff they're trying to do is not helping, you know, in terms of in, in the economy. And why are we ignoring that? It's it's always been the driver, right? When yeah. what is it? When China gets the cold, we get the flu or yeah. whatever the thing is. I don't know. I just think it's uh, something you have to pay attention to. So at this, I think the market is expensive. The China man. stuff to me, forget the geopolitical with Taiwan, just the just the, the 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 growth and the data that you're getting is so bad. And you know, it's funny, go back to January when they did the about face on the zero COVID. It was such a huge injection of like enthusiasm into our markets. Going back to your point is that our markets, you know, had been suffering a little bit from, you know, just basically China's zero COVID and people thought it was going to be game on and it was game on for our market but it hasn't really been for our economic data. It hasn't been for Europe's economy either, if you think about it. So when is that premium or whatever that excitement that was put into the market in January, February, when is that going to come out? You know what I mean? So yeah. I don't know. I, I, I feel when like you think about Brazil, if you told me Brazil would be the best yeah. kind of macro trade, some people had a Vinny Porter were there, yeah. other people were paying attention, right? Again, there's always places to put your money. So. All right, last thing um, on, on on one of the futures here. I want to look at the crude oil, and you mentioned it before. You know, it had this huge run back in March. You know, like when when we had that regional banking crisis, I think a lot of folks were okay back in the recession, hard landing camp. Right? They thought there was going to be some sort of kind of overflow, at least to our economy. And it's interesting. Quickly, you saw crude oil rally pretty aggressively um, into like mid to late April or so. We sold off. It looked we made a new 52 week low. Um, I think some of that definitely had to do with the China demand um, in general. And now here we are. We're kind of back at those levels here. What do you expect? Guy, guy remains very bullish at crude. I, I am not. I'm not bullish at gold as you guys are. Um, I, I feel like that if you guys are right on the weakness in the economy, I just don't see how crude oil stays above $80. It's hard you know? to price in geopolitical Correct. risk into oil. And I, I'll say it again. Like I said, when oil was at testing 65. I said, I still feel good that you can own the stocks themselves, right? If you go below 65, you know, you got to start to question kind of the out years for earnings. So I use this as a barometer more to trade the energy stocks and selectively get in and out of them than I do trying to predict yeah. where oil is going to go. And Nat Gas, I don't know if we get a chart of that. You know, we're going now, we're going to go into the shoulder months for Nat Gas here quickly. I can't believe the summer, we're already almost in autumn here, is when you want to start to buy Nat Gas. And so, again, we're going to go back through this conflict again we're going to annualize this thing again with russia yeah. and ukraine i can't believe it but you know gas pipeline and storage and all that stuff is going to come back into play again so i certainly would not be short net gas dan i don't want to make a position on oil but i think that the energy stocks themselves will continue to be fine so. all right last thing um you said that was the last no thing. no that was the last thing in the futures last thing i want to hit in the stock market um today there was a study on wagovi this is the weight loss drug that nova nordis makes um talking about reducing the potential 
of those who are obese on this drug of heart attack and stroke by 20%. The stock's up, I think, you know, 16% or so in a straight line. It's making new all-time highs. If we pull up Lilly, they make uh, a very similar drug. So this is good um, for them with their Moderno drug. And you look at this and you look at the combined market caps of these two companies, Danny, they're nearly $1 trillion, okay? And really, I think when these drugs started getting some steam, I want to call it a year ago or so, a lot of folks in the industry were thinking this could be a 30 40 billion dollar a year sort of drug now people are suggesting or analysts are suggesting it could be a hundred billion dollars okay so when you start seeing data and these studies suggest that it can help all sorts of things okay um you know you, you say to yourself it's it's a bit of a wonder drug especially if there aren't some of the symptoms or some of the um you know negative effects that that some folks have kind of suggested here a little bit we've talked about it a bunch um i've been doing wagovi uh through row body for six months i'm down nearly 35 percent when i tell you that my 35 percent or 35 35 pounds, 35 pounds so nearly 15 percent thank you for yeah, that no problem and I i'm think, gonna buy it s and yeah put on you but yeah. i've had no side effects and yeah. when i tell you that my cholesterol is down my blood pressure is down my sleep apnea is a lot better i just feel a lot better um all around and then i see a study like that it says when you're on a drug like this um that you have a 20 percent chance potentially okay this is my situation my story here of lower uh risk of heart attack and stroke it makes me feel a whole lot better here so it's interesting though and, and i want to broaden this out a little bit because this has been very specific to these two names. I know that Pfizer, all these guys are going to be testing a bunch of drugs. And let's pull up Pfizer's chart, and then let's pull up uh, mRNA, okay? These two companies, you know, with these vaccines, if you're in the camp that their production of them and distribution of them, you know, really kind of helped put an end to the pandemic here, I think to a large degree, at least got people back to school, back to work and all that sort of stuff. Let's look at a five-year. Look at how these stocks have round tripped those whole moves. Now, we all know the pandemic was going to be over and COVID was going to go away at some point. And if you look at that, it's pretty astounding. Pull up mRNA. A lot of people thought this was a company that was going to be able to use this technology and apply it to other diseases and other illnesses. It's round trip the whole thing. Those things think don't look like they're going, uh, they look like they're going lower here. Go back to the Novo, go back to the Lily. I just want you look at this sort of bottom left, upper right, straight line on news. What does it say to you about what investor sentiment is towards stories that they think are transformational here? It's pretty simple. If I have confidence that the companies will continue to beat earnings, then I'm going to, it shows up in a model is better. Flip side of that is Pfizer and Moderna, where not one hit wonders necessarily, right. much more for Moderna than Pfizer. I mean, Pfizer, obviously, yeah. a lot more products out there than Moderna. So is it going to take another, God forbid, pandemic to yeah. make those stocks move higher? I don't know. So what happens? They rotate. Fund managers rotate yeah. out of Pfizer and into, they can't afford to not be there. This goes back to my point, what fund managers within the sector, if they want to maintain an equal weighting on healthcare, how they move around. They can't afford to miss something like that. Very similar to AI in the sense of the yeah. behavior of within tech, right? Within a sector. That's it. You think we go back to PayPal, right? PayPal has been a dog. Okay. PayPal was in the tech camp. The guy, it, it gets screened both as a financial and as a tech company, yeah. but the nail in the coffin for PayPal, and you bring that chart up and what it was, to well, me, five ironically, year, five year. AI will, was the last nail in the coffin for them because the people that are hiding in names like that that are cheap. I'm not saying I wouldn't be short PayPal. I don't even know no, what the earnings estimates it. are. But my point is this, Dan, it's just rotation. And those things will normalize over time. They'll come back in. Obviously, not short Lily, not short Novo, anything like that here. But my point is that it's just an overreaction. Yeah. I overreact to it because I know that I can own it because I have faith that they're going to beat the earnings. That's all it is. Yeah. PayPal is a very cheap stock. Um, they keep guiding a little bit lower. Here's a company that has a $70 billion market cap. They have $10 billion in cash. They have $10 billion yeah, in stock's debt. Cheap. It, no, no, it, it, it's actually really cheap. It's a great yeah. example though. This stock had a huge gap on their earnings. They're expected to grow earnings and sales low teens next year. It trades at 11 times. It's supposed to grow sales nine, uh, 9% 9 next year, 14% EPS growth trades 11 times good balance sheet this company had a bigger market cap at its highs in 2021 than bank of america that is the bank of Listen, america it's not going to stay this cheap i think and and you know it's prime for an activist it's prime yes. for a lot well, of there, things there's, been lots well, there's of a couple that have tried but but anyway so all right so let, let's just recap really quickly so danny moses is guy and uh my podcasting partner on, on the tape that's every friday afternoon um friday morning friday morning it drops and we do record it on thursday afternoons but just to kind of reset here so you want to be short the crap names you are good at it you do it like you define your risk you use options that sort of thing you've been all over the buy now pay later a lot of these uh, fintechs you've been over spacs that sort of thing you think if the market's going to sell off 10 percent, these things are going to come down much oh. more you want to own gold 
Yep. Right. You want to own gold. I do. Um, own you, treasuries. You want to own treasuries. Yeah. So just so you know, I'm along the TLT. I know. Okay. Oh, you know that. Oh, I okay. Know. And it's been a little painful and I've been trading around it, but I'm kind of at my price. We detailed the TLT trade um, that I did in options on a couple of weeks ago. And I was down a lot. And now I'm back to even a little bit. I've been trading around it a little bit. I think we're going to have a pop here. I think we're going to have the 10 year yield. I think we're going to head back towards that 370 mark or something like that. And I think if you're right on the economy, Okay. And if you're right on rate cuts and everything like that, I think the TLT probably just made its low too. So that's All right. My, that's my two cents. All right. Danny Moses, thank you for being here with us today. Guy Adami will be back tomorrow. I want to thank our sponsors, CME Group, where risk meets opportunity. There are fine sponsors. And of course, FactSet providing all of our charts and data. Um, we're going to have a bang up week. We got Liz Young, we got Carter Braxton Worth, we had Lori. Danny Moses week. Yeah. Oh, we have Lori Calvacina on the, on the Tape Podcast yep. again. That drops Friday morning. So check it out, people. We really appreciate you being here. We will see you again tomorrow.